Who are you? <laughs> That's an interesting question. Well, um, I guess I'm a composer first. I'm, I'm married to music. I enjoy the feeling of satisfaction of having completed something during the day because I either am starting a new work, editing a new work, or completing it. I can't seem to let go of a piece of music I'm working on. I actually wasn't comfortable in calling myself a composer until I had completed a number of works, and I can't say specifically when it was, but I think actually is when I started recording music. This is the 10th anniversary of my collaboration with John Carollo and his collaboration with Parma Recordings. It's been a wild 10 years of working with a completely original, totally irreverent, and just wonderfully engaging guy, and, uh, and I think a terrific composer. And to me, it's very clear when musicians believe in their own music. Carollo is clearly one of those guys. And after 10 years of working with John uh, through multiple projects uh, in various countries over a long period of time, it's really clear to me that he's a special guy with a special talent and an enthusiasm for life and music that I wish many other people had. Again, the issue at uh, 54. Uh, xylophone seems a little loud in here. Meron, just a note in bar 54, the horns are marked dynamically louder, horns and oboes. In 54. Yeah, and the moving part is just uh, color underneath. Uh, okay. <laughs> When I sit down and, and write music, I generally don't think of a composer that I want to emulate or have the audience think that I had this influence by Beethoven, for example. However, I do have a tendency to listen to a certain core group of composers that have lived in the ancient past, Monteverdi, Bach, Beethoven. I adore Spanish music, especially piano music. I keep a list of possible titles for music on my desk. And if I'm inspired to write for the title that is on that list, it will happen. But often, which is more the case, is that I will come up with the music and then the title follows. But the atmosphere has to be very quiet, so I'm, I'm best composing in the early morning hours and late evenings. And I have to do it in isolation. I can't have a bunch of people in the house making random noises. But generally, how I start is with four or five notes. And I get the rhythm down and perhaps a melody, perhaps not. And I do that on a keyboard. If you record Brahms too, everyone knows it and you're basically dealing with, you know, just little details. You know, here we're kind of building a piece that's it's gonna be the definitive recording. And John is, um, you know, his rhythms are quite, quite complex and um, you know, they need to add up to a composite rhythm. And uh, you know, he mixes a lot of duples and triples and quintuplets and you know, those, those are really the challenges because sometimes things have to line up and then sometimes it has to sound you know, more jazzy. Performing a new composition 
is much more challenging. It's like you discover something new, it's something else. They didn't expect uh, this kind of piece, which is um, it's completely unknown, of course. So it's not only about the expectations, it's about challenges. I had, was influenced by a soprano from London. She was into conservation and nature, and she says the perfect um, artist to get your poems from is William Blake. I was familiar with this art, but I wasn't familiar with this poetry, so I bought a thick book of poems, and I narrowed it down to seven, maybe six poems that I really liked that had to do with as close to nature as possible. And I set that to music for soprano, uh, piano, guitar, and cello. That music sat on the shelf. But the second uh, principal violinist for the Honolulu Symphony, his wife is a soprano, and I approached him and I said, let's, let's get this performed and learn the music. And he said, fine. And so I worked with them on the music. I would sit in their parlor and we would have a, a, a talk back and forth. And that's why the music that we recorded this morning sounds refined in the sense that it didn't need a lot of polishing because I had already done that. I got that recorded and performed at the broadcasting station in Honolulu. They um, performed it live and then we recorded the music. And as I was listening to the recording, several years later, and this was in 2011, it, it then became a work for soprano, piano, violin, and cello. I took all the music from the guitar and transposed it for violin. So I had to par down, pare down the music so that we could actually enjoy the soprano singing. The reason that the other music that you hear sounds busy is because that was the instrumental section of the song cycle, which to me had some wonderful music to it. And I thought, yeah, this is where the orchestra can really get in and um, uh, excel. I have been very impressed with the violin section um, and how uh, smooth and, and, and I don't know if silky is the right word, but they've got this beautiful, rich tone. And I, I enjoyed the, uh, the pianist very well. I, I think all the musicians are top notch. I enjoyed the, uh, what we heard this morning with the slides that the trumpets did. Just everything, the smoothness of the oboe, the, 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 it's wonderful musicians. Very pleased. There was a, a wonderful book written by a philosopher Oh, I can't remember his name now. It's called The Book. I learned from reading that book in philosophy class at San Diego State University when I was studying music and psychology, is that human beings grow up to believe that they're separate from nature, but we're really not. We're part of nature. It seems like it's, we're, we're going toward a much faster decline in recent history than in, than in the past two or three hundred years. And I wanted to emphasize that nature surrounds us, of course, but that human beings are also part of nature. We're not separate from it, and that's a philosophical um, point of view. It, it turned out that when I wrote the song cycle, that was the emphasis. But then when it came to writing the symphony, I had a different take on it, because what I had heard, it, it, it turned out to be a story about love and the relationship of, of two um, persons who enjoy the mer early morning hours and so uh, they're stretching and they're moving around and and th th they uh, are actually uh, enjoying the sunrise and so that's the, the poem uh, to morning that um, William Blake wrote was perfect for the first part of the symphony and then it, it leads into the second part where I, I firmly believe uh, we understand each other more through bodily movements and, and gestures than through what we say verbally. It has a lot of energy to it. And then the third part, um, a romantic affair happens. 
I wanted the music to be romantic and not in, in a classical sense, but with some drama and some emotion. The um, third part is where boy meets girl, so to speak. And then the, the fourth part is where they actually have fun because it's late at night and the sun is down. And, and that's why it's called uh, Let the Evening Stillness Arouse. And so, and because that the fourth section was uh, the, uh, another song that I took from the song cycle. The music will be uh, more relaxed, uh, sensual, and exciting. And it's actually, I was telling the conductor during, uh, while we were eating, it's the last climax of that work is the best part of the entire symphony as far as I'm concerned. I hope that, that this music has a life after the recording. I'm sure it will. Um, and it, it, I think it will get the audience to think more about the planet and the need to preserve what we had and hopefully we can reverse some of the, the things, that are, uh, some of the ways our behavior has affected nature. Mm -hmm.